Hello and welcome to this 2017 McLean County Area EMS System Preceptor Update. First off, allow me to say thank you for the time and effort that you as preceptors spend precepting our students and helping them become the most successful uh, paramedic uh, and EMT they can. Um, we do not say it often enough, uh, but thank you so much for being willing to share your knowledge and experience with the next generation of EMS providers. Here is the agenda for today's uh, virtual preceptor update. We're going to talk about the purpose of the update, some changes to the program, we're going to discuss specifically the various phases of the field experience. We'll also discuss what exactly constitutes a team lead and also break down the definition of what is a competent entry-level paramedic. Every single year we host a paramedic program advisory committee which is made up of various communities of interest including students, agency representatives, program staff, in addition to a general member of the public. We had a meeting last May and it was discussed that it would be helpful to have a preceptor update and to discuss and to re-emphasize some key points. Historically, once the initial preceptor course was completed, there's been a lack of support in terms of continuing to provide resources and reinforcement to preceptors. This virtual preceptor update is an attempt to remedy that. As most, if not all of you are aware, we've created a satellite location of our paramedic program out at Heartland Community College. We have transitioned our program from four academic semesters to three academic semesters, which was the old Heartland model. This was accomplished by making students complete a one-semester anatomy and physiology course as a prerequisite to entering the paramedic program. With this change, there have been some other changes to some other program components as well. The phases of the paramedic field experience include BLS team member, BLS team leader, ALS team member, and ALS team leader. The phases themselves have not changed, or at least not significantly. However, we wanted to re-emphasize to preceptors what the expectations should be of students within each phase. In the BLS team member phase, um, they're simply orientating to the operations of the particular agency and of the pre-hospital environment in general. For some students, this may be the first time working on an ambulance. Most EMT basic students are required to do some form of clinical time on an ambulance, but this can really vary by program. Time in this phase can best be spent by discussing and practicing BLS skills, explaining the anatomy of an EMS call, and practicing with BLS scenarios. Students in this phase should be focused on observing how calls work, not necessarily performing the ALS skills for which they've been cleared. This phase should last for a minimum of 20 hours. During the course of this phase, students should be expected to be able to participate in BLS calls, but not necessarily lead them. In the BLS team leader phase, students should be able to successfully manage all aspects of a scene, conduct a basic patient interview using techniques such as a sample history and OPQRST, and should require only minimal prompting by the preceptor. The student should be able to formulate a BLS treatment plan utilizing local system protocols. The BLS team member should also be able to perform any intervention that they call for in their treatment plan, although the focus is not on the actual performance of the skill, but rather the ability to delegate that skill to another team member. The BLS team leader phase lasts a minimum of 40 hours, during which time the student must successfully complete five BLS team leads. These five BLS team leads can count towards the student's required 50 team leads which are required for graduation. During the ALS team member phase, the student should be able to perform all ALS skills for which they have been cleared in the simulated lab environment. Skills that students are cleared on in the early phases include endotracheal innovation, re-verification of BLS airway maneuvers, in addition to intravenous access. 
Skills such as needle decompression um, and other trauma skills are covered later in the course. The student should be able to take direction in this phase from the team leader, the preceptor. The student should be able to contribute to the team by making suggestions and offering potential differential diagnosis. They should be able to carry out the treatment plan that has been formulated by the preceptor. This phase lasts a minimum of 40 hours and there are no required patient contact minimums for this phase. One of the areas that we want to emphasize and review is the ALS team leader phase. The ALS team lead is the capstone experience of the paramedic program. ALS team leads can occur beginning in the second semester. No ALS team leads may be counted when the student is in the first academic semester. A student may not receive a team lead for a topic area which they have not yet covered during the didactic portion of their course, meaning that trauma team leads are not eligible until either the course is concluded or late in the third semester. Students will be issued a letter that they can then share with the preceptor when they are eligible to begin practicing as an ALS team leader. The number of hours a student rides is also being monitored by the program and should be discussed with the student by the preceptor to ensure they're not utilizing an excessive amount of field hours too early in the course. During the ALS team lead phase, the student should be performing limited ALS skills, if any at all. Rather, their focus should be on the patient, conducting an ALS assessment, history taking, etc. They need to delegate the performance of skills to either the preceptor or, if qualified, the preceptor's partner. The ALS team leader phase consists of a minimum of 250 hours, although usually it's significantly more due to the call volume that we see throughout the system. During this ALS team leader phase, um, students are required to obtain 35 team leaders for ALS patients. In addition, um, the, the total number of required team leads is 50. 35 of those must be ALS, and up to 15 of those can be BLS team leads. One of the questions that we commonly get, in addition to uh, there sometimes being a disconnect of information, is so what exactly constitutes a successful ALS team lead? So the particular objective items that we're looking at um, are, can be broken down into several categories. Um, and these categories are also listed on the team leader management documentation form. So for scene management, was the student able to recognize any potential hazards and were they able to take or cause to be taken actions to ensure safety, such as uh, notifying hazmat, notifying law enforcement, uh, making a request for a TRT team. Obviously, these are all things which will be performed by the preceptor, but it's incumbent upon the student to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to recognize these and to make those types of requests. Patient interaction. Was the student able to interact with patients, bystanders, and others related to the call in a professional and appropriate manner? Equipment. Were they familiar with the location and the use of all needed equipment for that particular patient encounter? Were they familiar with the monitor? Were they able to identify location of medications? Things of that nature. A physical exam. Did the student perform an adequate physical exam based on the patient presentation? And was it appropriate? In terms of obtaining a patient history, was the student able to perform an adequate history and ask clarifying questions based on the patient's responses? Did the student have the knowledge needed uh, of needed pre-hospital medications, including the indications, the contraindications, and the appropriate dosages? In terms of treatment plan, did the student formulate a safe and appropriate treatment plan for this patient? If the student um, you know, created a uh, treatment plan which would have been dangerous to the patient, obviously we, cannot, we, we can't have a team lead at that point. Radio report. Did the student successfully complete a radio or a phone report that was professional and included all necessary pertinent information? 
Delegation and leadership is also is oftentimes the most difficult component of the team lead to uh, demonstrate, but it's also the most important. Oftentimes, our culture in public safety makes it appear to outsiders, including students, that we do not enjoy being told what to do. It's important for you as a preceptor to reassure your student that this is what you expect them to do, because the only way that we know that they know is if they tell us. For this portion, the student must be able to articulate verbally to you what they want you to do. All of these criteria and objectives are listed on the call management documentation sheet. There is a scale of 1 to 4. If any category is below a 3, then the call management must be counted as a failure and cannot count as a team lead. The numbers 3 and 4, uh, the criteria are listed on the screen. Field competent, functions at entry level terminal training, no guidance required. Three. Appropriate for performance level. Functions as a level expected of a student. If you have multiple threes, meaning you have uh, more than two items that are marked as a three, then it, sh it should not be counted um, as an ALS team lead. The majority of the items need to be marked as four, field competent. Now, it's important to understand a minimal amount of coaching can occur um, and it still be con it still be counted as an ALS team lead. However, that coaching must be minimal, and it must not relate to any critical criteria that affects uh, a patient safety. So, what are those critical criteria for a team leader? Um, a, a violation of any one of these critical criteria constitutes an automatic failure of that ALS team lead encounter and as a result cannot be counted as such. Um, if there is a scene safety issue that the student did not recognize, if the student did not assess the mechanism of injury or consider the possibility of multiple patients if the scenario called for it, if they did not use BSI, if they did not perform all of the critical criteria of the patient assessment, if the student did not, pro did not provide or provided inappropriate BLS, ILS, or ALS care. If the student provided care that was detrimental to the patient. If the student utilized the wrong protocol. If they did not accurately report the assessment or care rendered to the patient. And if the student did not report information in an organized, cohesive manner. Any instances of these types of occurrence constitutes a failure of the team lead and cannot be counted. Other critical criteria include the student having improper interactions with family, bystanders, or other agency personnel, if the student did not provide appropriate care based on the needs of the patient, if the student did not have adequate knowledge of the equipment or pharmacology, if the student had a poor attitude that hindered patient care physically or psychosocially, once again, if the student commits any of these team leader sins, it is counted as an unsuccessful attempt. One of the phrases that we hear time and time again um, as preceptors is the term competent entry-level paramedic. But what exactly does that mean? The definition of a competent entry-level paramedic is an individual that can operate safely within the standard of care. The definition of the standard of care is the degree of care, skill, and judgment that would be expected under similar circumstances by a similarly trained, reasonable paramedic in the same community. Entry-level paramedics will not be as proficient as you are. As preceptors, you are some of the strongest EMS providers with, that the EMS system has to offer. These students uh, and uh, soon-to-be graduates are just starting out in their careers and obviously do not have all of the experiences that you do. The student is not measured against another student, another provider, uh, the, a uh, clinical liaison, or the preceptor. The student is not measured against past experience by the preceptor when he or she was a student. The student is measured by cognitive, psychomotor, and affective skills 
in which the program has provided documentation to give you a scoring tool for. The standard itself does not change throughout the field experience. However, we expect the student's performance to rise to the uh, standard um, uh, much more uh, as that experience goes on. But the standard itself does not change. And the standards themselves are not subjective, but rather they're objective. Using the critical criteria and use it, utilizing the other criteria that are listed on the documentation sheets. That is, that is how students are to be evaluated. The, uh, we, we cannot have subjective evaluations. They have to be rooted in fact, they have to be rooted in evidence, and they have to be documented. This is one reason why it's so important, whether it is paper documentation or whether it's completing documentation in Platinum Planner, to have a uh, factually accurate uh, accounting of the student's performance on a given shift day. One of the issues that we sometimes find is that preceptors uh, are marking everything as competent and appropriate and everything is fine, and then it comes to the end when the student has completed all of their program requirements and the preceptor says that the student isn't ready because there are all of these problems. The problem that we have as a program is that we don't really have a significant leg to stand on when those problems have not been pointed out to the student and they're not documented in their clinical documentation. So here are some examples of not a competent entry-level paramedic. A student who does not have a firm understanding of medication indications, contraindications, and dosages. A student who is unable to perform psychomotor skills, such as IV, intubation, EKG interpretation, with a reasonable rate of success, as defined by the program. A student who is unable to take a patient history or perform an adequate physical exam. A student who places themselves or their crew in unsafe situations. A student who does not appropriately interact with patients, bystanders, or others involved in the patient's care. With these examples of not being a competent entry level of paramedic, we should be able to go back in that paper documentation or in Platinum Planner, and we should be able to see instances of these things documented. As a program, when we see these shortfalls, we will work with the student to try to create action plans in which to overcome those obstacles. You as a preceptor hold an equally vital role in that process um, to help point out to the student, these are where your shortfalls are and here are, potential, um, here are potential ways to be able to work through that. In addition, if a preceptor needs any type of resource, advice, counseling um, to be able to assist their student, we remain uh, ready to assist in any possible way and provide any resources that you may need. Examples of, of a competent entry-level paramedic include a student who can implement an appropriate treatment plan and can also explain why they are implementing that specific treatment plan. Just because the protocol manual says so would not be an acceptable response. A student who can, with reasonable proficiency, perform ALS skills and understand when and why to perform those skills. A student who interacts appropriately with patients, fellow crew members, and other healthcare providers. Also, if a student successfully completes all of the program requirements, then chances are they are a competent entry-level paramedic. The completion of field time will be the last component before successful completion of the program. Historically, we've had students who had completed all program requirements, and the preceptors were not providing recommendations, either good or bad, and just having the students ride indefinitely. Once all program requirements have been met, the preceptor needs to make a recommendation. Continuing to ride can be a recommendation. There needs to be definitive documentation as to what the deficiencies are and ultimately how were they able to complete all of the program requirements and not be a competent entry-level paramedic. Remember, it is the program that makes the final decision, not the preceptor, although we weigh decisions heavily based upon your input. And uh, most of the time, 
um, will, will take those recommendations at face value so long as the supporting documentation for uh, the deficiencies have been uh, articulated clearly. Thank you for taking the time to view this preceptor update. In addition, thank you once again for the time that you spend um, molding our next generation of EMS providers and all the time and effort that you put into it. Without your tutelage and without your expertise, um, our program simply would not be possible and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. If you have any questions regarding either the EMT basic or the paramedic program, you can always reach out to me in the EMS office or you can also reach out to John Dassow. Once again, thank you um, and stay safe out there.